And so in 2001, these guys come to me. And this was really sort of, of a turning point for us in our business because they said, look, we, you guys do good work. And they, they had checked us out. And they, you know, we, were, we were a small, neat, um, clean, fast little organization doing self-performing work. And it sort of kind of fit with what they needed. They said, we want you to help us mobilize onto this project. And so they gave us a list of about 40 different things that we were going to do. We were demoing the old tennis courts, taking down the old fence, and putting up this huge plywood construction fence all the way around the project, right? And then we were creating some new temporary sidewalks, uh, some new detours. Uh, anyway, so all that was about 600, and we were just happy to have the opportunity, you know. What are some of the qualities of your business that, that you think like caused them to call you back and say, we want you on this job? Like, it, I'm, I'm assuming safety is involved. Safety is huge, always huge, especially on the underground utility side. In our business, um, on the underground utility side, it is, it's a tough business. Uh, it's, uh, it's probably one of the most complicated things that, that you'll do. And so we've always had, uh, it, every day, it's always, always a dangerous situation, and we're always dealing with on the underground utility side. Because one of our, one of our, one of the things that we really like is we like complicated underground utilities. The more complicated, the, the better off. Because we knew that getting into this public work, that we were going to have to sort of kind of, besides being a successful minority-owned company, we were going to have to differentiate ourselves from our competitors, you know, and, and, and uh, I was fortunate because I had a mentor in, in that underground utility business, or, or, or I, I, I grew um, um, into a relationship with a, with a prime contractor who did a lot of heavy underground utilities for the city of Houston. And he was the guy that I was doing sub work for, you know. So name some of the, the things that make it complicated. You say you like a complicated job. I mean, I know it's closed spaces and... It's confined spaces. It's deep. And soil conditions, in a lot of cases, can be uh, very dangerous. And so you have elements that you, you, know, you have to be very careful with because in order to control that environment that you're going to work in, uh, you've got to be really crafty at what you're doing. Um, because it's, and I'm talking deep. It could be 30 foot deep. It could be... Uh, you know, 20 foot wide, um, and it could be on Kirby Drive. Kirby Drive, we ha we put in a huge drainage box system for the city um, in 2008, I guess it was, and that system was, that was a 12 by 14 foot box, and it was, we started at a 25 foot depth. With and the we traffic went, going by? We went right through the villages. We were right through Rice Village, you know. Um, that's pretty uh, complicated. It, it's dangerous as well. And talk about the, the safety record that you're so proud of that goes with that. Well, and, and again, for us, we've, we have had to, because as you're growing, you know, you're not just growing organization, you're growing equipment, you're growing logistics, you're growing, and, and you're growing safety. And so we really started working towards, okay, we've got to come up with a way. And when I mean detail, it's like when you have a lifting device, you have to make sure that that tag is on that lifting device. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these guys are blowing and going, and, oh, we're, the tag is gone. And OSHA sees that, and they will, that's a violation. That's like speeding. You know, it just, mm -hmm. you're going to get written up. So, so we started to pay attention to detail and checklists and, you know, um, then we started doing what they call JHAs, and we had done JHAs before. And that stands for? And it's a job hazard analysis. And when you do the JHA, you pretty much are sitting down and planning before you start the project, um, and you're going through all the safety issues, what if and how and what and where, and, you, and you're defining all of that, and you're basically developing your plan for how you're going to approach the work. You know, some of the key guys are, um, uh, these are project uh, superintendents, and these project superintendents 
uh, when we, they're specific. They may be concrete guys or they may be underground utility guys. They're, it's a little different from your typical, and we, we call them superintendents, but they're underground utility superintendents or concrete paving. Uh, we, we, have a, we have a couple of guys who specialize in, in the... Uh, in the hardscape type stuff. We do all the corner plazas and uh, pavers and that stuff down in the Galleria. We have a contract with Uptown there to do that. We've got a couple of guys who specialize in doing all that fancy, pretty stuff. Um, but we have uh, we have the concrete superintendents and then we have the underground um, superintendents. And then we have a, a job, a, a, a project superintendent guy who manages those guys. And then under the underground guy, his key guy is... Uh, He's, he has a foreman that sort of manages all the logistics and all the people, and he'll manage uh, our heavy equipment operators who are very important. Everybody's important. I mean, we, we all play a, a huge role, but, uh, but our heavy equipment operators are huge when it comes to underground utilities. Uh, those guys are, are, are very skilled at what they do. Uh, they make anywhere from $15 to $20 an hour. Uh, they usually work. 60 or so hours a week, uh, key guys. And then for them, they have what they call uh, pipe layers and, and pipe layer helpers. And those are actually the guys who do the engineering, field engineering for laying those boxes or setting that, laying the water, because you know, you have grades and it's not just, it's, uh, and so the pipe layers are the guys that do all the technical installation, if you will, of the work. And then they have helpers. How do you attract your employees in the first place? Like, what word what makes a guy come and say, "I want to be a helper at Rage Tech"? It's by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. It's it's by so they know they it's know in people. the community of our workers. Yes. As a matter of fact, the guys that we hire that typically stay with us are people that know other people in the company. Like in our company, there's uh, about five sets of brothers that and, and of the and the five sets of brothers and all five of those sets of brothers, there's cousins. You know, we e-verify, so it's really difficult for us. Uh, of the 10 guys that walk through the door, two of them might have the documents that they need. And, and that's probably the biggest challenge. You must be treating your employees well enough, though, that, that like a brother would tell his cousin, oh, we, yeah, it's a good company, come work well, here. We take care of our employees. One, we pay them well. Two, we, and they're paid as employees. They're paid as employees. There's not, we don't have a subcontract or any, or contract labor or any of that kind of crazy stuff because all of our work is public work. It's all certified payroll. And I am, I'm a, sort of a, I'm, I'm a hands-on owner. Um, I don't uh, um, uh, go traveling off to Vegas every other month. Uh, and I'm not a big fisherman and I'm not, I don't play a lot of golf, although my wife would love for me to play more golf. But I love my business, and I love my employees, and I think they know that. I mean, I've literally told my employees that. They, they know the kind of person that I am. That kind of attitude, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because, you know, my dad, my dad was a superintendent for 38 years for Southern Pacific. And uh, my dad had a third, third grade education. And he was, just, uh, he was just a hardworking guy, but his claim to fame was that he spoke Spanish and he spoke English. And so when they were building railroads back in the day, and they needed people like Augustine who could speak Spanish and speak English. But one of the things that Dad always said, he said, he said, you treat those people the way you want to be treated. We're all human beings. We probably work better. We're probably more productive if we feel like we're wanted or we're needed. Now, there's some people that take advantage of that. And those are the kind of people that we just, they don't fit in. We eventually get rid of them. But, but the message is that if, and if it starts at the top, I was one of ten. Um, I, I don't think I had my own bed until I was probably, you know, ten or eleven years old. I always had to share a bed with somebody, and, and, and you know, we were very cat. We we are very Catholic. My mother was was always uh, always stayed home, and and she raised all ten of us. My dad was always had a steady job, and but but we were always respectful and mindful of the fact that we were blessed, really. And it was like. We were poor, but I didn't know we were poor. I was the happiest kid in the world. I thought, wow, this is cool. I mean, I love this. is life. I love this, you know. And I had my one pair of shoes for the year and my two or three pairs of tough skin blue jeans. I mean, so 
it, so you know when you come from that when you come from that that uh, that background you know you're, you're sitting there and you're looking at these guys and you're going uh, that's my dad when he first started you know or uh, that was me when I worked you know here or I worked there so it's it's important that you have compassion for your employees but you have you have to manage that because you have a business to run as well 